Together with me is my co-chair and my great, great friend, uh, Dr. Ho Hee Hua. Um, so we'll be doing this uh, hybrid version of our APEC DCD Congress. And it's really excited to see so many of my friends face to face at long last. Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunities and excited to see so many of you in person once again. And for our overseas uh, attendees and faculties, uh, a warm welcome from Singapore. Now the title today is uh, APEC DCP Corvallis. So for one of you who maybe I, you know, I'm probably not as well educated in classical education as my good friend is Dr. Ho. So when you wonder what that means, is is really talking about DCP. Where do we go from here? Okay. So today we will have a lot of very exciting talks lined up. But I think while we are opening these sessions, it is, I kind of look back at how the whole journey started in 2014 when we first have our APAC meetings. And you know, the focus at the time was mainly looking at primary angioplasty. And we gradually moved it around in, uh, across the region. We moved the meeting to Hong Kong. And some of my good friends and colleagues have also traveled around the world with us to Hong Kong and then subsequently to Taipei. And we all knew what happened in 2020, and the whole uh, movement turned virtual. So we have multiple meetings in the virtual settings. Um, and I'm really glad that now, at last, we, we get to meet again. And I hope that some of you who are on site here in this beautiful venue uh, get to enjoy uh, meeting some of your friends and also uh, enjoy the food as well. I'm also very grateful during all this time to get to meet so many of you and make new friends. Um, no, no, obviously, my great friend, co-chair, uh, who actually co-founded the movement, Dr. Ho Hee Wah, and all the gangs from Tang Dog Sing, Dr. Fahim is here, uh, Diana is here, and I'm really, really happy to see all of you again, and thank you very much for the support over the time. Um, I, I thought, you know, I also particularly need to thank our uh, really super efficient and uh, no, no task is too difficult secretariat, uh, with Yilin, uh, Christina, and Agnes over the years to help us. APEC have evolved over the time. We were talking about primary angioplasty, then we developed into uh, the intracoronary imaging and physiology APEC high course. We also have done APEC chip. So this is the first time we're actually dealing with the APEC DCB meeting. Um, so without further ado, uh, maybe I will just flash up the agenda for today. Um, you can see that you know after I finish talking, we will go through the trial update. And then we have two fantastic speakers lined up uh, and also overseas faculties to join into the discussion and panels. Um, and I would be really encouraging all of you to raise questions and discuss it. I mean, it's nice to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Let's make the most out of it uh, for our uh, uh, attendants on site. And for our overseas candidates, please type your questions in the inbox. So can I maybe pass over to Dr. Ho uh, to introduce our good friends and faculties today? OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. So uh, first of all, a warm welcome to everyone uh, on site and online. And uh, for today, uh, we have a, a, a stellar panel of experts in DCB. We have, uh, first of all, uh, Professor Franz Kleber from uh, Germany. And we have also uh, Dr. Sunao Nakamura from Japan. We have our uh, good friend, Dr. Ong uh, Tiong Kiam from uh, Sarawak, Malaysia. And we have Dr. Ai Cheng Xie from uh, Taiwan. So just uh, uh, we plan to keep this uh, session interactive, so feel free to type in your questions and answer. And for those of you who are on site, uh, you can speak on the mic and, uh, and uh, generate some discussion as well. So we, without further ado, uh, we will move on to the uh, opening uh, uh, talk. Uh, and so uh, Paul will be giving us uh, the uh, opening lecture. Thank you very much, Eva. Just waiting for the uh, PowerPoints to load up. Okay, so, so this is the talk, um, DCB angioplasty in Asia, okay, uh, about this, where do we go from here? Um, let me see, make sure this works. Yeah, this is where it begins. Um, I know my eyesight is not great. I don't expect you to be able to read all the small print, except to say that you know, angioplasty started about you know 
uh, almost 30 years ago when uh, the first angioplasty was done uh, in Switzerland. And since then, you know, there have been very a lot of developments. So those of us who is old enough to be practicing PCI back in 2006, uh, at that time it was uh, something really exciting happened. You know, uh, suddenly you have something called drug coated balloons. You can actually do angioplasty uh, and get very good results, if not as good results as a stent. Um, so this is something really, really exciting at the time and really unusual. And that kind of pitched the interest of a lot of us uh, interventionists to use the drug balloons to treat, in particular, instant restenosis. I do remember back in 2006, there was still a, a very big market in bare metal stands. So when I was training with a fellow, I love bare metal stand because you know what, we're all clocking up cases, isn't it? So when the patient has bare metal stand, you kind of think that one fifth to one quarter of them will come back to you in six months where you can balloon them again. So isn't it great to now have a procedure in the form of drug balloons where you can actually treat that very successfully? So 2006 was a game changer in that sense. Then it, for any new technology, sometimes you know, the fashion comes and go, and you know, this year it's gray, and next year it's black, but you know, the drug the balloon stood the test of time. And after you know, many years and many usage by a lot of us, um, the European and uh, uh, the ESC and EACTS guidelines came around in myocardial revascularization. And here, drug the balloons formally get put inside as a recommendation. So recommendations to treat instant stenosis for both bare metal stands and DES were given the class 1A recommendation. So recent trials update we will talk about later on, uh, we'll share this together with Dr. Ho, who is the acknowledged the grandmaster of dark coated balloons in Asia Pacific. Okay, so we will talk a little bit about bare metal stand and DES ISR, the use of drug balloons in small vessels, the use of it in acute coronary syndromes and also particularly very topical, the high bleeding risk of a patient where DAPD can be a problem. I think this, this is a good way to start when we look at some uh, meta-analysis uh, and this is the Dadalus trial. So we look at drug coated balloon angioplasty compared with DES implantation in treating uh, coronary stent restenosis. So we are, first of all go back to where drug coated balloons indication was to treat ISR. And I know a lot of complaints and, and doubts uh, happens when we say there is no large scale randomized control trial. But for you, those of you who actually was used to doing trials, you know how difficult it is to actually carry out randomized control trial for drug coated balloons. But here, there is a very large scale trial and looking at multiple studies and I have a meta-analysis looking at it. Um, so here, we look at DCB use for patients with both the DES and or and BMM, bare metal stands ISR. Uh, and it's look at a series of studies and the follow-up period. Again, uh, this is a busy trial. Uh, not, not easy to look at all the details here. Suffice to say that, you know, in the bare metal stance group, there's, there's certainly not much difference between the two groups of patients with ISR. Okay, whereas in the DES, there seems to be a slightly different signal, but we'll look into that more carefully. The primary efficacy first, okay, in terms of, you know, target lesion revascularization going up to three years. Okay, this is not your six months follow up, but three years follow up. And you can see the series of trials being carried out. Okay, on the bare metal stands group, on the uh, forest plot on the left hand side, you can see that um, there seems to be, you know, uh, the effect of the uh, uh, fixed uh, effect um, and also uh, on the lesion effect, there was no difference, really no difference in terms of using either a DES implantation to treat this ISR or you put uh, drug coated balloons to treat the ISR for bare metal stands. So this is really good news. In the DES-ISR group, the signal seems to be slightly different. It seems to be slightly in favor of implanting yet another DES within. And you can see in the forest plot, um, the uh, fixed effects uh, and random effects seems to be slightly in favor of implanting a DES. Um, but in terms of safety, Okay, so what are the safety, you know, at the end of the day when you're treating a patient, not only do you want the procedure be, to be uh, effective, you also want to make sure the patient is safe. So this is looking at the composite endpoint of myocardial infarction, death, and also target lesion revascularization thrombosis. 
Here, in the bare metal stand group, no difference in between the two. But surprisingly, in the DES group, it seems to be slightly in favor of truck-coated balloons. So here you have a little bit of dilemma. Maybe you know for DES ISR, putting another DES in seems to be more seems to be better in terms of target lesion revascularization. But in terms of safety, you might be compromising a little bit, whereas DCP seems to be the safer option. So here's the conclusion from the study, as I said, similar effect and safe as far as DMS is concerned, straightforward, maybe DCP will be a better option. But for DES, here you have a slight dilemma, you have to make a choice. Maybe you have a better outcome, uh, uh, if, uh, effect in terms of reducing TLR if you plant, implant another DES. But if you use DCP, it seems to be a safer option. So something to think about when you're treating this group of patients. So the important points here, of course, is DES, ISR are always going to be more challenging to treat than bare metal stents. So our techniques in lesion preparation and all those, so stent failure in the modern contemporary DES has become rare. And when that happens, usually there are other issues involved. So maybe just putting a DB in or just treating it with a second layer of stent may not be so straightforward. And I think a lot of you here are avid, you know, avid users of intracoronary imaging. So you know, the guideline also suggests that in treating DES, IRSR, it is really recommended that you put in intracoronary imaging to find out the exact cost of the incendiary stenosis and choose the best treatment option. Um, I think Dr. Ho and I still also believe that TCP remain a very good option in treating DES, ISR because they avoid multiple layers of stents and reduce the potential to reduce the DABT duration. And I know that you know, some of us are heart sunk when the patient comes to you with three layers of DES inside with restenosis, how are you going to treat with those? So we're using drug coated balloons to avoid those dilemmas. Okay, of course, you know, lesion preparation is paramount in any of these situations. I want to move a little bit to the use of drug coated balloons in uh, de novo lesion, in particularly the use of drug coated balloons in smaller vessels. Um, here, there's a study of basket small uh, two studies that were published in Lancet 2018. It's just before all of us get locked down, isn't it? Okay, the, the definition of small vessel in this particular study, they look at vessel which are three millimeter or below. So small, but not that small, okay? And the maze is largely looking at cardiac death, uh, non-fatal MI, and also in a TLR after 12 months. So here you have it. Um, DCP versus DES, and I think DES here is still using a lot of Pachytaxel stand at the Texas stand at the time. So you can see that there's hardly any difference, statistically significant, and no difference between either treatment arm when you're treating small vessel uh, disease. Use of drug coated balloons and drug coated DES, no difference. And you look at the survive, uh, Kleppenmeier curve, in fact, you see a slight benefit, at least initially, over the first six months when you are using uh, drug coated balloons, which is the red line compared to the blue line, which is DES. But the two trends gradually merge into one. If you look further out uh, to, I think, uh, we'll come to that. Um, so the basket small uh, study is probably the largest uh, randomized control trial uh, in the use of uh, DCD in de novo small vessels. And it really does in the data suggest that, you know, using this is something as good as, if not better than using DES. Um, Dr. Ho and I got invited uh, to write a uh, editorial on this trial, and this is basically our opinion. I think it's, this is especially relevant in our part of the world in Asia, where you see a lot of small vessel diffuse disease because of uh, the diabetic uh, tsunami in this part of the world. I was alluding to that, you know, the earlier study was one year follow up and now they actually follow up for three years and you can see on the Captain Meyer curve, the two curves more or less exactly overlap over the three years period. So this, the use of a single use drug coated balloons in the vessel to treat uh, de novo lesions actually stood the test of time. Maybe at this point, I would uh, just stop talking a little bit and hold, hand over to my co-chair, Dr. Ho, uh, to talk about the use of drug coated balloons in acute coronary syndrome. Okay. Oh, can, can I have the slide? I'm just continuing with the talk now. So I, I'm just going to continue uh, where Paul left off. Uh, so we're going to move to uh, show you some data on the use of DCB in the setting of acute coronary syndrome. So we start off with the ST elevation, myocardial infarction, and primary PCI. 
and there's this uh, trial called the Revelation, which is the first RCT uh, evaluating the use of uh, DCB versus uh, DES uh, in the setting of primary PCI. Sorry. So if you look at the uh, table uh, showing you the uh, procedural uh, characteristics, uh, as we all know, when we do uh, primary PCI, there's a lot of thrombus. So uh, the investigators perform a thrombosuction uh, you can see that it's about 80% in both arms. Uh, so I think the important point is that if you use DCB in primary PCI, you have to clear the clot. And it's important to do the prepper, uh, vision preparation. So with thrombus, you have to aspirate if there's significant thrombus. And this is followed by the pre-dilatation. And you can see that it's 100%. Uh, and when you have fulfilled the uh, angiographic criteria, then you can use uh, DCB as the final step. And in that uh, study, uh, uh, they, they, they had to do a bailout stenting in about 18% of patients. When it comes to the uh, primary endpoint uh, for the study, uh, they had a very interesting primary endpoint, which is uh, FFR at nine months. And what they show is that uh, it was similar in both arms. And when it comes to the heart clinical endpoints like uh, maze, cardiac death, recurrent MI, uh, again, uh, there was no difference uh, in both arms. Uh. So what uh, the study shows is that uh, in the setting of uh, STEMI and primary PCI, uh, DCB strategy was non-inferior to DS in a selected group of patients. So another way we can use uh, DCB is, is in the setting of NSTEMI. So there's this trial called the uh, PACCAT NSTEMI that was uh, published by uh, Dr. Bruno Scheller in the Euro Intervention. So when you use a, a DCB in a non-thrombotic lesion in n stemi versus a DES plus bare metal st stent, the outcomes are similar uh, at 12 months. So the study again, uh, you can see that uh, it's small size and part of it is uh, they use bare metal stent in the control arm. But although uh, this is a small study, but again, it, it adds important new data uh, uh, to uh, convince us that uh, DCB can be used in this uh, n stemming group of patients. So the, the last part is uh, regarding the use of DCB in high bleeding risk patients. So I'd like to highlight the debut trial, which is a single blind randomized RCT that was performed to evaluate the use of DCB. And uh, again, the, uh, you can see that a lot of people are still using bare metal stand to treat patients with high bleeding risk but uh, may not be too applicable uh, because we have a lot of uh, high bleeding trials. But what this trial shows is that the maze rates were actually much lower in the DCB arm. It was designed to uh, show non-inferiority, but what they found was it's actually superior. They had a superior outcome in the DCB arm. And at nine months, the uh, maze rate had only occurred in one patient in the DCB group, but you have a higher maze in the bare metal stand. So what the conclusion of the trial was that uh, PCI with DCB was superior to patients with bare metal stent. So this can be a feasible approach. So I think what we can say is from the uh, existing literature, there is no head-to-head -head RCT comparing DCB versus a second generation DS in the high bleeding risk patients. So duration of DBT can be as short as one month. But if you uh, put in a drug eluting stent, either the BioFreedom, Onyx, uh, there is always a risk of stent thrombosis after you stop the DAPT after one month. And the stent thrombosis rate can range from 1% to 2%. But if you decide to put a DCB, I think there are two advantages. Uh, first of all, uh, the fact that you have no stent, then you do not worry about the risk of stent thrombosis. And in some patients who bleed quite badly, actually uh, you can even use a single antiplatelet. So these are some of the advantages of using DCB in the high bleeding risk group of patients. So regards to uh, DCB, are there any safety concern, uh, any signal of increased mortality when you use it in coronary arteries? Uh, this concern arises because there was this uh, meta-analysis in the peripheral uh, arterial disease where they showed that there's possibly a signal of harm when you use uh, pachytestyl DCB. So there was this meta-analysis that looks at the long-term survival uh, after we use DCB in the coronary uh, artery disease, and this was published in JCC. So you can see from the, uh, this big meta-analysis is that uh, there's no signal of harm. 
In fact, uh, at two years or three years, they may, there is some suggestion that the all-cause mortality and the cardiac death is actually lower in the DCB arm. So we can be rest assured that you know, when you use DCB, uh, the long, there's no uh, concern about long-term safety data for, for our patients. So I'd like to highlight another important uh, consensus document, which is, is the uh, uh, third report of the International DCB Consensus Group. I think Paul was involved in the uh, write-up of the paper. And uh, this is a, a very good, uh, a very important document where it summarizes all the historical background of DCB and the uh, current uh, updates. Again, uh, they emphasize that uh, in order to use the DCB, you have to prepare the lesion very well. So very important to have uh, uh, optimal lesion preparation. And they start to recognize that you know, in very complex lesions, calcified lesions, you can use uh, tools like rotoblation, lithotripsy, and uh, also you can use uh, you know, intracoronary imaging. And you can see from the uh, chart on the left on the blues, uh, they also uh, recommend that you can perhaps use uh, physiology to assess the lesion before you decide whether to use a DCB. So a, a FFR cutoff of more than 0.8 is, is also a possible uh, approach. Despite all the advances, I think uh, one important uh, 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 approach that we still must not forget is the uh, classification of uh, dissection. This is a very old, 30-year-old uh, 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 classification of dissection that was developed before the uh, pre-standing era, but still very relevant to our practice. So for any of uh, our fellows, uh, this is something that we have to know by heart. So any dissection that's A and B, it is safe to leave alone. But anything above that, you have to do a, a bit of stenting. I think for many of us who are, we've been using Parkinson's over the years, I think we recognize that uh, definitely it is a very useful tool, but there are limitations that we face in a cath lab. Uh, sometimes it's very hard to deliver the balloon, and you know that you have a limited time to deliver the balloon within one to two minutes. So that's why uh, there is a lot of interest in the uh, uh, Limus based uh, DCBs. So we have a lot uh, currently in the market. And uh, the, the thing about serial Limus is that it is not a very lipophilic drug, but I think the, each company is coming up with their own technology to facilitate the drug transfer and drug retention in the wall. So you, you have uh, uh, new products like the Magic Charge, the Solution SRR, and then uh, you have the BioLimus uh, DCB. So I'm just going to share with you uh, two recent uh, first in-man trials that evaluate the use of uh, serolimus DCB versus uh, Parkitaxel DCB. So in fact, uh, B. Braun has their own uh, serolimus uh, coated balloon. So this is the, one of the first in-man study that evaluated the use of uh, sequin uh, serolimus uh, coated balloon versus Parkitaxel coated balloon. So they evaluated the use in 50 patients with uh, DSISR. And what they found was that uh, the, uh, the, the, it, when it comes to the primary endpoint late lumen loss at six months, uh, both groups were similar. Okay. And uh, more recently, they evaluated the use of uh, serolimus versus Pachytasa coated balloon in cor coronary uh, de novo lesions. Uh, and uh, the study was done by the uh, Malaysian group of doctors and uh, Dr. TK Ong, who's in uh, our Panelists here today, he also was involved in the two studies. And this was just recently published uh, uh, this month. And uh, they enrolled about 70 patients. And uh, again, the primary endpoint was late lumen loss at six months. So the findings were that the, uh, they showed similar angiographic outcomes. But when it comes to uh, late lumen enlargement, uh, you can see that it is more frequently observed after you apply the Parkitaxel treatment arm. So you see that in about 60% of patients. So what I think the data suggests is that uh, uh, Parkitaxel coated balloon is still the DCB to beat. But you know that there is the serolimus coated balloon, but I think we need more uh, data on that. So where, where are we now in 2022? I think, uh, I think uh, what we can see is that from all the studies, there is expanding usage of DCB beyond ISR, and there are many supportive clinical studies. It is a very crowded market. I think you can see that every stand company is uh, investing in their own uh, form of DCB. But what we can say is not all DCBs are equal. Uh, Sequence has the most robust data in terms of uh, 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 
safety and efficacy. And, but, however, we have to acknowledge that there are limitations with the marketable DCB. And as cardiologists, we all like to try new uh, things in the lab. But with all the imaging products, I think we need more data before we can use it in our daily uh, clinical practice. Uh, so I think this is a very exciting field that uh, we, something that is evolving over the years and we look forward to more data uh, and, uh, uh, so that we can change our practice. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kaiwa. I can just sense the passion in you when you talk about DCP. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule, so maybe we will move forward with the next speaker. And please keep your questions. And if those who are online, please type it in. Um, I think um, we're going to move to the next speaker. But beforehand, I, I thought, you know, for those who are not here, you know, we're actually in a beautiful room. And this, this, this you know, whole uh, grand ballroom is really nice. And for those who are here, you look around, this kind of reminds you of the limestone uh, cave that some of us would go when we travel to Vietnam and places like that. In fact, if you use intracoronary imaging, when you look at very heavily calcified arteries, those limestone uh, pictures are actually what you are going to see in the arteries. So you can imagine treating those arteries can be extremely difficult. So our next speaker, we're very really privileged to get uh, Professor Kleber uh, to dial in uh, from Germany. He is probably the father of DCP. You know, almost every single important clinical trials involving drug balloons have him in the paper. And the consensus group, uh, writing papers are all been championed by them, by him. And he's a senior author for most of uh, drug coated balloons related publications. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's invite Professor Kleber online to talk about his experience of using drug coated balloons in heavily calcified artery. Franz, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for your kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I uh, thank you both, uh, Eva and uh, you, um, for the possibility to, to uh, uh, present some of our recent uh, uh, insights into this field. Um, <clears throat> actually, uh, it's uh, somewhat preliminary data, what I present. Um, and I haven't uh, really presented this before. Um, a DCB, <clears throat> as you just mentioned, is uh, sometimes difficult to uh, deliver. Um, uh, part of it is that the surface of this balloon is not comparable to a regular balloon because you have the drug with the eopromide uh, on it. Um, and secondly, um, if, if we deliver it in a calcified lesions, it can, it can get really difficult. Furthermore, we do know that calcified uh, lesions lead more often to dissection uh, due to the high pressure application. And um, uh, as um, Heva just showed, uh, uh, high grades of dissection uh, make it impossible to use the DCB only. So um, of course we want to uh, avoid severe dissections. <clears throat> and in this field, um, lithoplasty came up and uh, not so many centers have uh, gained a lot of experience in connection with uh, DCB use. Uh, there is a generator and uh, I, um, uh, over the uh, a, a, um, uh, RX catheter, it's uh, actually easy to apply. Um, um, uh, it's a, a high energy transmitter that's embedded in the, in the um, catheter and an energy of 3000 volts is applied by the emitters in the balloon. And this, this vaporizes the fluid in the balloon and this causes micro bubbles. And these micro bubbles uh, uh, um, uh, give uh, uh, rise to a uh, um, sonic wave and this cracks the calcium within the wall and even the uh, um, calcium deep in the wall. And I think this is uh, the difference uh, between other um, treatments uh, like rhodoblader, uh, which uh, addresses only the superficial calcium. Um, the difficulty in some cases uh, is to reach the lesion because the catheter is uh, still more... Um, uh, 
uh, higher in size and, and more difficult to place. But once you leave, uh, reach the lesions, you have a very good possibility to crack the calcium. Um, so we use this uh, for the last uh, several years. This is again the catheter, easy to connect in the cath lab. Um, you uh, uh, connect it to the uh, generator and uh, here to the catheter. This is a connection cable to the generator. And, and this is a catheter itself. You see a balloon in the end with two transmitters, which apply the energy <clears throat> And, um, and this is the connection to the uh, generator. Uh, this is the generator itself. You, you have a power on, uh, you have the, uh, the charger, so it's with, without um, connection to the uh, electrical currency at the moment when you apply it. <clears throat> and you apply usually um, uh, uh, 10 pulses uh, and you have the catheter currently has the option to apply these 10 pulses uh, eight times. So if, yeah, overall, you have 80 pulses to apply to the vessel wall. Um, since October 2018, um, where we started the lithoplasty, we treated uh, 30 patients in, uh, uh, with, with, with 33 uh, lesions, 33 uh, uh, different uh, PCI sessions. Um, uh, and um, uh, two of these patients had uh, uh, spot stenting in adjacent segments, but we just look at the segments um, or the patients that were treated with lithoplasty and thereafter with DCB only. Uh, we, of course, also um, uh, used uh, the treatment for for patients with a combination with stents, uh, used it in patients with instant restenosis, but this is not my point today. In two patients, we uh, indeed used additional load ablation because we could not access the uh, lesion. Um, we used a, a guide extension in one patient and a body wire in uh, the other uh, uh, patient. So, well, you can see these uh, lesions are difficult. Uh, lesion location was the proximal or mid LAD in 21 lesions, RCA in six lesions, left circumflex three lesions. We had even two patients with left main and one saphenous graft lesion. Now it doesn't move, okay. Um, Patient's mean age, uh, you would not wonder, is high, 83 years. Angina class was three. Um, uh, the calcification was judged as severe in 28 of these lesions and moderate in five lesions. And the patients uh, who needed uh, stents in the predominant lesions, um, uh, as I said, um, are not in this series, which I report today. Um, we had uh, to predilate the lesion with a small balloon in uh, actually the majority um, of the cases. Um, and we had um, lithoplasty balloon ruptures quite often, 36% uh, percent of our cases. This of course depends very largely on which lesions you, you use lithoplasty. Since we started very early with lithoplasty in 2018, we had predominantly very, very severe calcifications and very difficult um, lesions and old patients. So balloon rupture in the literature are much lower, but I think it depends really on, on what you're doing. Uh, balloon ruptures were without any uh, severe sequelae. So um, uh, you just uh, use another um, um, lithoplastic catheter and that's it. The follow-up results were evaluated in further um, uh, visits and um, with, with angiogram and telephone interview, <clears throat> but uh, the follow-up is currently not uh, 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 enough to, to be presented. All the PCIs with lithoplasty were successful um, and um, follow-up has to be presented later. So let me, let me show you uh, some of these cases so you can imagine um, what we found. This is a 85-year-old um, lady with severe angina and you see the lesion in the LAD here in the area where diagonal branches arise and you see 
the uh, non-compliant balloon 20 bars and it doesn't open. Here on the left side, now you see the far bar, uh, bar uh, lithoplasty application and you see during the course of the uh, uh, lithoplasty application that the balloon opens at four bars. And on the right side, you see the final uh, result after the um, lithoplasty and after application of the drug coated balloon. This is an RCA lesion. Um, it was very difficult to reach this lesion with the lithoplasty balloon. Uh, sometimes you can uh, use a snowplow advancement. Uh, and this uh, was what we did in this case. You can, again, you see the balloon that is initially didn't open. And then the right side, you see a good uh, final result. <clears throat> Another uh, Case is this here, 72 years old male, Canadian classification engine three, osteal LAD, a uh, little bit distal left main as well. We pre dilated with a 2.5 millimeter balloon. Uh, then we had a rupture of the little plastic balloon and needed a, a second uh, balloon. We had um, a second uh, little plastic balloon because we pre dilated before with 20 bars. And uh, then we had a, a three millimeter uh, non-compliant balloon, which we had uh, a complete expansion with. You see here, osteal LAD, uh, distal left main, and uh, you see the result on the right side. Again, a lesion that was not dilatable with uh, 20 bars. Third case <clears throat> is an 83 year old female Again, Canadian classification class three angina, high grade mid LAD lesion. Um, she had, had a thoracal radiation after breast uh, carcinoma, 1976. At this time, a high uh, uh, dose was applied uh, usually, and these patients have uh, always very difficult treatable lesions. She, she had severe unstable angina. <clears throat> Uh, increase in uh, TNT, so it was an enstemi, renal failure, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. So these patients uh, really have a very polymorbid situation. As you see, she also had an aortic valve replacement. And here you see the lesion. <clears throat> Lithoplasty catheter was difficult to uh, advance, <clears throat> but finally we got there and uh, <clears throat> we're able to dilate this lesion. And again, you see here a very, very nice um, result. Um, case four, 81 years, <clears throat> left main lesion, uh, still angina after mid LAD PCI two months uh, earlier. And you see here the, the left main, you see the little plastic catheter uh, within the lesion, you see the two, uh, guide wires in LAD and circumflex. On the left side, you see the acute, acute result, there's uh, some dissection, and on the right side, you see the follow-up result, uh, which we have already in this, in this uh, lady. And you see, this is a very nice result, again, without stenting. <clears throat> the most uh, prominent uh, result we had from this uh, early experience of lithoplasty plus DCB in the novo lesions is that even in lesions that we consider as very difficult to reach with the DCB, we can easily access, usually without any, any difficulties. And we think that the preparation of the, not only of the lesion, but also of uh, uh, the vessel before the lesion, um, which uh, might be quite tortuous and might be uh, also heavily calcified, makes the uh, uh, tissue more uh, pliable and, and softer, and then you can advance DCB. And that's why we believe that the combination of lithoplasty and DCB only is a, a very nice uh, possibility. <clears throat> uh, so we uh, currently say uh, the combination seems to have a low complication rate. As I just said, the most intriguing result is uh, um, uh, that we can reach the lesion so easily 
Um, uh, I think this offers a new window for DCB delivery to calcified lesions, especially in uh, lesions difficult to reach. The long-term results, of course, we have to, to await, um, but so far in these patients that have been, uh, that we have been able to, to restudy, we had no increase in um, restenosis rate. Um, of course, the lithoplasty cancer deserves further development and delivery and stability, but um, it's already a big uh, move forward. I thank you very much. Really impressive. But so it's the time of a discussion. Um, is it possible to bring up our other speakers and panelists and bring them on screen? France is really impressive. I, I you know, I think the, the, your study in particular, 30 something patients and the average age of over 80 year old. Uh, that's, that's really pretty impressive. Um, Kaiwa, you, I think you have a question for France to start with, right? Uh, uh, hi, Professor Kaiwa. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Uh, I think uh, you showed uh, quite fantastic cases on how you use uh, DCB and uh, IVL uh, in those uh, patients. I just want to ask, uh, did you use much intracoronary imaging in your first 33 patients? And uh, does that uh, help you, you think, in determining whether uh, which therapy you would choose for your patients? Actually, we did not use uh, a lot of intercoronary imaging in these cases. Yeah, maybe I will, I will want to swing the questions over maybe TK, TK Dr. TK Ong from Malaysia. Um, you, what's, your, what's your view on use of, I mean, shockwave arrived in Malaysia yet? I think there is some early experience in shockwave. Yeah. I mean, how, and I know you use DCP a lot, and I'm sure you were actually involved with calcified arteries and, and the use of drug of the balloons. Maybe you can share your experience with us. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, IVL has arrived, uh, but uh, we are only just uh, starting to use it. Uh, and uh, I think we've only done one case in my institution. So for calcified lesions that we want to use DCB, uh, we tend to use uh, either rot uh, rotablation or orbital artrectomy uh, followed by a scoring balloon. And we find that usually with these two combinations, uh, we can actually get very good luminal gain and uh, we can finish uh, the job with uh, a drug called the balloon. Um, we have had done quite a lot of calcified additions in this manner and uh, we have had follow-up uh, angiograms for some of these cases as well and we are surprised uh, by the durability uh, of, the, of the result after DCB. Okay. Uh, any comments from uh, uh, Dr. Nakamura or Dr. Ai Cheng uh, Okay. Uh, good. Maybe question to Dr. Kuleba. So actually, I have an experience of four years experience of the shock because uh, so in Japan, not yet, but uh, I have an experience with Antonio Colombo. Uh, four years, so actually maybe I think I guess uh, totally 150 or something like this. And uh, just one concern, it's uh, so actually debunking from the, you know, by the rotation acerectomy and uh, diamond back and compared to the shock wave, it's a different, maybe different picture. So do you have uh, any strict uh, confidence or strict evidence of the efficacy of the DCB on the surface of the cracked culture region? Of course, we expect it a lot. But uh, Professor Kureba, can you, uh, can, can, uh, could you make a comment about this? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a very early stage and uh, I think the most important part would be to await the, the long-term results. So far, uh, we have not seen a lot of restenosis. Um, uh, my impression is that after lithoplasty, the, the uh, lesions behave very similar to other de novo lesions. Um, our, our main aim was to, to gain access to these lesions because um, we all know that DCB uh, uh, can be extremely difficult to, to, 
uh, get the DCB to, to solution in, in, in severe calcifications, um, probably even more than some of our stents. And um, with lithoplasty before you can reach the lesion. And, and now we have to await the, the long-term results. Uh, thank you. And also so one, one more thing. It's so actually uh, superficial clarification on the saphenous being graft or instant resonances or native coronality may be di di different. Can you guess, uh, you know, all the parts? Yeah. I, I think we did, we did uh, also cases with instant resinosis um, and there's uh, already some, some publications out about uh, ISR and, 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 and lithoplasty, while the combination of uh, DCB and lithoplasty in, in de novo is, is new basically. Um, uh, apparently it works also in instant resinosis. Um, we just had this one case which I presented in, in uh, Safina's rain grafts. Um, this is, I think, too early to, to uh, conclude anything from Safina's rain grafts. In this patient, it works well. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, in Taiwan, actually, IVR is not available so far, unfortunately. So, so for the severe calcified region, we will use the rotaborator or sometimes a scoring balloon. For example, NS, and, uh, for example, the NC alpha scoring balloon to do the predictation uh, angioplasty, and the followed by maybe DS uh, standing or maybe the DCB treatment. That's our current status uh, in Taiwan. Thank you. So the message is new lesion preparation. Um, yeah. It will be a shame not to use, uh, not to borrow some of the expertise in our local uh, team here in Singapore. So maybe Ronald, Ronald, over to you. You use probably a shortwave, and I'm sure you're a DCB operator. But you saw the results. Can we have a microphone to, to Ronald in table one? Um, we, we, sh we are uh, seeing, you know, uh, France using uh, shortwave and DCB in osteo LAD lesions and left main lesions. Uh, Ronald, what, what's, what's the practice over in uh, <laughs> NUH? Oh, so I, thank, thank you, Paul, for the question. I certainly cannot speak for everyone from NUH. Um, I, I myself am mainly restricted use of DEB um, jug coat balloon uh, in, in patients with instant stenosis, especially those with uh, diffuse lesion and um, and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, 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 calcified lesion where uh, DES delivery could be problematic. But I agree with all the comments here. I think the uh, lesion preparation is important and intracoronal imaging will certainly help the uh, delivery of the balloon. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe over to Fahim. I know you, know, you, you and Dr. Ho try to outdo each other at times in the lab. Can, maybe you can share a little bit of your, your experience of short waves and DCB and what's your take on. We also mentioned about rotor. Uh, orbital and short wave. What's your take on that? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, nobody can outdo Dr. Hall, so uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just a, a disciple. I, I think the, 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 the Dr. Clever made an important point about using shock wave and calcific lesions. Our own uh, anecdotal experiences that when you do shock wave, you actually get a really, really good POBA result. I mean, the artery sometimes looks absolutely gorgeous after a shock wave. Um, and so I think the, the technique is very promising. We, we have done some cases. Um, I can't say we have longer term follow up um, as we do for many of the other non calcific de novo lesions. But I think it is very promising because the, I think for the audience, the important thing to understand is that when you're doing shock wave, you're also working on a diffusely diseased artery. And so while the conventional wisdom is to stent, uh, you end up stenting a long segment of vessel just because of the diffuseness of the disease. And so in that situation, uh, substituting a stent for a DCB and, uh, is a very attractive uh, notion. And I think we hopefully will have more data on that uh, as uh, time goes. So it's very promising, I think. Thank you. It's almost a kind of hybrid approach, isn't it? So I think in the interest of time, maybe we will hold the discussion. Um, over to you, Kawa. Okay, so uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, the next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Sunao uh, Nakamura from uh, New Tokyo Hospital in Japan. And we all know that uh, Japanese operators are world-class when it comes to CTOs. 
And Dr. Nakamura is also a, a, a fantastic CTO operator. But for today, he will give a different perspective on how he used a drug-coated balloon. Uh, and he will combine it with the use of DCA and uh, he will share his uh, uh, experience in Japan. So over to you, uh, Dr. Nakamura. Okay, thank you very much for a great introduction. Uh, good afternoon, my dear friend, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to say congratulations on APAC First Hybrid Webinar 2022. I'm very happy to join you. I'm Paul Ho, my dear Singapore friend, and thank you very much for inviting me. And also very happy to share my idea with my great respect, Professor Kureba, and also my dear friend on the Professor Chan. And today my title is a novel idea to combine all the elements, DCA and DCB. I want to present my idea with my cases. New idea is nothing more nor less than a new combination of the all element. And the capacity to bring the all element into the new combination depends on the uh, ability to see relationship. This is uh, James Wes Young, American writer. Let's go back to the early 1990s, 30 years ago, at dawn of the Nintendo Super TV game. We have an interesting toy for intervention cardiologist. That was a direction coroner select me. They come to the stage just before the stand, but soon because of powerful stand, this year lost everyone's interest and lost the market. Of course, we have a several trial to find out that they have some efficacy, but most of them are fair. So this year went into the grave. About DCB, go to a very great start. Such a beautiful dawn accumulated the basic and clinical evidence a lot importantly, Professor Kreber. He was always sent out the DCB evidence. Of course, instant listenosis, DCB have a very strong evidence. About the small coronary artery, which is uh, some difficulty in plantation because it's a uh, small. So in this small vessel PCI area, we have a nice study showing the remarkable efficacy of the DCP. Uh, actually, Antonio Colombo, my great friend, he loved DCB and conducted clinical trial, which is a better study. Toro Naganama, my junior, he was Antonio Colombo's lab at that time that he wrote this paper. And also we have a several paper showing the efficacy of even in a large vessel. This is from the International DCB Consensus Group. If the region is not so complicated and could get a good vessel preparation and beautiful angiographic results, which is a no flow limiting the dissection and less than 30% distance stenosis, consider DCB. All very reasonable, but some um, uh, humble. Switch back to the topic of the DCA. Actually, DCA had shouted in the grave, I'm alive. And they are the guy who have, who could have this scream. They dig up the grave of him. Or, or the Japanese, like a 12 apostle, then can say maybe I'm a missionary. Actually, they reported several beneficial effects of the DCA in the PCI, such as if the region is big enough, like a left man, result is quite okay, and the IVAS is very useful, and an aggressive developing with the IVAS guided by DCA is very nice, and also those that show the benefit of the DCA in the case of bifurcation area, but he mainly cut a part of the LED uh, proximal. So finally, they remodel DCA to be very strong, like a Captain America. Like this, in each unit, they remodel. Then current DCA devices by Nipro, very sharp cutter, the smaller catheter, taper noscon, more flexible, smaller competitive catheter, same French, high MDU 6,000 RPM, double speed than original, and use a better balloon. So nowadays it's more very friendly, user friendly and powerful device. Let's review those. Cases. This is a case of HCO gentleman who had a stable angina having a history of the PCI two years ago. He came to the hospital because the angina gained 
Ejection fraction 52% of big ischemia uh, in a scintigraphy and a several coronary risk factor with a slightly decreased renal function. Chest XP and ECG quite normal. And this is the uh, RCA. This is okay. And left CT, as you can see, big true bifurcation region in the left main and another true bifurcation region in the mid circumference. Maybe you may think you cannot finish one stand, two or three stand may be required. Another view, left main true bifurcation region. Let's have a discussion. It's your gentleman who had a severe angina and left main bifurcation severe stenosis. Of course, need a discussion with the surgeon, but okay, this is go to PCI. And second, if you want to do PCI, what type of a complex stenting we need to do? Third, any other option? At first, I present the IVAS pictures, LED, and the circumference to the OM. So now you can understand, we have a double tool bifurcation region in the left brain and the circumference meet. Actually, we had a coronary, sector, coronary CT picture beforehand. Upper panel shows the IBUS on site and corresponding to the lower panel coronary CT. As you can see, we had a calcium deposit in the left brain to the LED and the OM, no calcification in the circumference proxima. Again, no calcification in the circumference proxima and much plaque burden, this finding contribute to make decision our strategy. Again, please look at the IVAS picture with the circumference proxima. There's a big plaque burden, more than 80%, as you can see. From this angiogram, the IVAS, you may assume that we cannot avoid the double stint, maybe still. And of course, everyone believe if we can finish one stand in a perfect region long term, result will be nicer but looks very difficult to finish one. As you already know, we have a two dogma in this area. For a stenting group in a European group, maybe I think a friend of you, and the DK crushers, DK crusher and the DK crushers in China and uh, Greg, also a friend of you. Uh, actually both friend of me, so I cannot take one usually. By the way, my great respect to Steve Jobs said, Don't be trapped by dogma which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. So I like to choose my own idea. At first, we'd like to uh, uh, divide the three part. Left main to the LED, diffuse region, some superficial classification, which is not good for the special device, uh, which I have uh, considered, but easy to implant the DS. Circumference, short region, very big product burden, few classification. Actually, this is quite good indication of the DCA. Circumference uh, to OM, diffuse region with some superficial classification looks easy to deliver the stem. So please note, very important point is using DCA in a circumference, because if you do that, we have a chance to avoid a complex overlapping stent in the left main region. Let's explain the procedure of this here. At first, we need a test cut like this picture. Of course, we can recognize the window of the DC cast so we can estimate the region direction of the cut. However, we need to confirm by the IVAS what we did, right or not. Uh, and after we confirm, we need to proceed to the next step. Again, after confirm what we did, right or not, like this picture, uh, you need to proceed to the next step. By the IBAS finding, we always get uh, all good orientation. Then we need to do the number of the cutting with starting low pressure like this totally around the 30 cuts. After totally around the 30 cuts, now you can recognize how much black burden we already removed. Actually, before procedure, big black burden, 88.6%, and after the precise DCA, 37.7%, less than 40%, residual plaque burden. These are the serious IBAS image after the DCL with a one and a two and a three and a four ATM and totally 29 cut like this. In each procedure, we are checking with the IBAS to make sure. 
then stenting. OM to left man, OM and the left man, finally with KBT and the final pot. This is final picture. How do you think? This is Cybus. How do you think picture picture? This is play on the post. We could avoid overlapping stenting. This is the point of the DCA in this subset. They are the very important for a picture, 4, 10, 16 months. As you can see, beautiful for up angiogram. Of course, physiology is okay. Additionally, usefulness of the DCA in the bifurcation area is not only reducing number two to one. Sometimes we can do that stentless. This is a case of LG, just proximal severe stenosis, maybe. Most of you will plan to cross over stent in the left wing to LG because this is very easy. But we can do the DCA perfectly. We can finish only with only the one DCB, like this. And this particular case had no stenosis. This is interesting case of left main severe stenosis after the V stenting. Maybe most of you will plan to cross over stenting and left main to the LED like this. But uh, if we can do this here perfectly, we can finish with uh, only DCB. This is the uh, IBAS picture. As you can see pretty much big property in the distal left main. Uh, just in front of the uh, V stent inside. While no obvious plaque in the LED and surface oxygen. At first, we do this year from left wing to the LED because the site of the stenosis is close to the stent, so we need to do a careful cutting. So, actually, 75 cutting, a little bit too uh, a lot, but uh, this is a very uh, because we need to do the careful cutting. Finally, plaque burden reduced the 91 to the 54. Next, this shift to the left main to the circumflex after totally around the 100 cutting because the careful num uh, number of the cutting, plaque burden reduced the final 42%. Then WDCP. Again, because of more than 100 cutting, we could reduce the plaque burden 92 to 43. And we had a perfect angiogram after the DCA three months. Finally, this is a case where it is CTO from just the proximal and some stump and some small island. Guide wiring, not so difficult to LED and diagonal, actually it could save diagonal. And small bunny, check IBAS. Then we could recognize a large black burden in a CTO with a less classification. Usually you may think like this stenting because this is very close to the bifurcation area. Such a uh, less classification, so we take a DCA. At first, we did a test cut uh, to confirm our direction, the cutting is okay or not. And after confirming, then the second and the third cutting like this, then finally, we could remove the plaque body more than 80% to less than 40%. Then this will be 4.0. This is the OCT picture, so beautiful. Final angiogram. Nice to see no stem PCI. Actually, if you had a good DC operator, we can reduce the number of the stem and possibly of the avoiding a stent related complication. So finally, if you want to do the this year, you need to be a very patient. Cut, cut, and I bus, and cut, 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 and I bus. Another cut, cut, I bus. Sometimes you need to cut even a flap in a dissection place. One German philosopher, Jonathan Sira said, one, those who have a patient to do simple thing perfectly will acquire the skill to do difficult thing easily. So far, we have a four paper about the DCA and the DCB. Only a paper, Dr. Oksumai Jr. showing the efficacy of the bifurcation PCI mainly uh, 
uh, so actually uh, left main area. I'd like to introduce uh, briefly. We use this year around the left main area 28 cases, the 31 region, the cutting site is exactly at its look in this picture, including eight severe true propagation region, the stentless PCI, 23 cases, and the 26 region. This is the patient region characteristic, 28 patients, including the 11 CKD patients, 2 HD patients, and also 10 uh, unstable patients, which is actually relatively good indication. This is the procedure characteristic number of the cutting average 28, and the max press, uh, pressure of the balloon is just 418. No stem PCI, 23 cases, 26 region. This is a QCI analysis, not so long region. There's a percent diameter census around the 10%. In the long term phase, we have a 28%, which is a late resonances. Intracoronary imaging study comparing the other papers, actually in our paper, in our paper, there's a black area showing around the 42%. This is small. I think this is actually, this is important. Finally, we have a three case of resonances, but so far we have a good clinical outcome showing the DCA and the DCB strategy, especially in the left main area. Maybe I think a same to be feasible. Maybe we still have a missing and a hidden treasure in your well, grave. Watch carefully, something precious is always behind the scene. Thank you very much. Fantastic talk. I think a lot of us are very impressed with what we have done with the DCA, uh, especially in your left main and some of the very challenging uh, lesions. Uh. So, uh, any comments from uh, our panelists and our on site uh, attendees? Uh? Any questions for uh, Dr. Nakamura? May I, may I ask one question? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mark Nakamura, I am just about what your comment made about patience. And, uh, and okay. uh, it seems to be a lot of work. Uh, so what's the average procedural time for DCA? Uh, oh, very good question. So actually, uh, we have a 20 intervention guys in our center, and uh, three of them is very, you know, pretty much like DCA. They do very well. So maybe I think a procedure time is uh, actually one hour and one and a half. Uh, this is wrong. But uh, so think about it. If he can do stentless PCI, this is maybe okay. Of course, just the stenting, five minutes. But the DCA, one hour. But uh, we have a, maybe I think a meaning. That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Nakamura Sensei, can I have Wait. a question for you? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, very good, nice, and uh, result for the DCA. So my question is, uh, how about the post-procedure medication? How long should we use the dual antibiotic therapy uh, after this uh, procedure? Actually, in Japan, maybe I think uh, all the procedure, just adaptable, you know, uh, lengths, it's maybe I think one month. Okay. After well, one month, yeah. Okay. Dual antibiotic All the same, all the same, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, France, you uh, have just a question? Dr. Nakamura, uh, oh, yeah. a, a short comment just. Uh, it no reminds sense. me very much on the very early uh, uh, DCA um, uh, time in the early 90s when I uh, used the uh, uh, directional arthrectomy in hundreds of patients, but at this time we did not have a DCB to, uh, to thereafter. Uh, your results are fantastic, and I think it's, it's a very good topic which you take up. Um, congratulations. Wonderful oh, thank results. You. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, I think a very small person who have experienced the previous DCA and current DCA. <laughs> Maybe you are like, like me. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Makaruma, in, in, uh, uh, we see surgeons performing uh, androctomy. Okay, so they open up the arteries and they surgically uh, resect the atheroma. And afterwards, they put these patients on two or three months of warfarin, and there are actually some data on that. 
Um, yeah. How would you, I mean, you are obviously doing it in a lot more you know, elegant way and in a much more sort of minimal, uh, minimal invasive way compared with how the surgeon does it. Um, what's your take on uh, DAPT and maybe anticoagulations on these patients? Okay, this is very great question, but uh, such a, I, I don't have any answer, but uh, any point is, uh, uh, you already know, maybe I think uh, if you are not a judiciary operator, maybe I think uh, maybe 50, 60% you need a stent because of the not beautiful surface. But if you are good to this operator, then you, if you can use uh, IVAS correctly, and you can see the beautiful surface, and then DCB, so we can get uh, this kind of result. So I think uh, uh, precise DCA and the checking IVAS and the DCB makes this result. Otherwise, it's maybe I think uh, most of the time, Need a stand. Okay. Any anyone local experience in in this subject? Anyone in Singapore? I know Heart Centre done one or two cases. And any any more experience from anyone here who have used uh, the use drug uh, DCA combination with DCB? No. Maybe I can ask uh, Dr Nakamura because uh, for many of us, when we started our training uh, intervention, the DCA is no longer uh, existed in the cath lab. So is there any uh, contraindications to using DCA? Because I noticed that a lot of your patients are not very calcified. And it seems like the humoral approach is the default approach. Right? So okay. if you're very heavily calcified lesions, calcified module, is it, is it suitable to use a DCA? Okay, we have uh, two contraindications of the DCA. First, uh, superficial qualification. Second, not a good operator. Do you understand what I say? <laughs> I have a question. Actually, this is uh, uh, for the young Japanese operator. I always talk to the talk to them. Should use every devices. Otherwise, you lose the technique. And uh, this year, you know, we need a technique actually, and we have a learning curve. But if you can, if you if you if you, if you are the good DC operator, you can open the next door. That's it, yeah. Fahim, you have a question? Thank you for a great talk. Uh, I just had a quick question for Dr. DCA. We move on to the How do you, uh, okay. ensure that your stuff cuts stuff. are in the right DCA. spot. So, I mean, as you I'm cut saying. in one direction, uh, no, no, uh, presumably you then have more plaque on the other parts of the vessel wall. And so do you use IVAS to direct uh, where you're gonna cut um, further or do you just visually decide where you're gonna turn the cutter and uh, then uh, perform at the, the uh, atherectomy? Okay, this is a very important part. If we want to do that this year, so actually we need uh, IVAS 100%. The test cut, and then we need to check uh, IVAS, and then this is correct or not, and then uh, do the another cutting, and then check IVAS. So something like this. So we need uh, we uh, we need a time. So actually taking time procedure. Always need uh, IVAS to make sure. And one more point is that. Uh, if we remove the plaque burden, actually around 50%, maybe I think the result is not so good. Maybe I think less than 50%, at most of 40%. This is maybe, uh, I think this is very important point. Uh, DCA plus DCB. Um, so I would like to move on to our next sessions. Um, here we did a little project uh, in collaboration with um, uh, APSC. Jack is not here, but I need to give him full credit for supporting this uh, project. And our fellow Anshin, who uh, helped us in drafting a questionnaire. 
And we actually did a questionnaire on the usage of DCB in the Asia Pacific, uh, mainly Asia Pacific area, but we actually get response from all over the world. So maybe you can come up with my next set of PowerPoints, please. Um, I thought this, this is a good place um, to actually share with some of you um, our uh, uh, impression of the, the consensus, uh, uh, our, our questionnaires and survey uh, of the uh, DCB user in our area. So we're all aware of the uh, third international consensus paper, or well, a lot of us were. Uh, and I hear that the various speakers early on have uh, quoted that uh, particular uh, paper. But I, I, what we want to do is we get to feel in the real world, how are we actually practicing? Uh, are we actually following it or are we actually modifying uh, ways? Uh, we saw the quote from uh, 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 Nakuruma Sensei early on, it's not what other people say, it's what you believe is right. So we, we just did a survey uh, of all the various users in our region and see how we are actually gauging it. So the next sessions we're going to do is we're going to share with you our survey and perhaps at the same time bring up some questions and you know I'm going to ask all of you on site in Singapore to help me out a little bit and see what your practice is. So, um, so excuse me for those who are sitting close to me, you, you probably will, the microphone will be heading in your direction. Um, there's a bit of technical difficulties in bringing up the PowerPoint. I also want to encourage you to raise any questions that you have because we, we are really privileged today uh, to have really good speakers and panelists here to ask, uh, answer, help answer any questions. So while we're waiting for the technical glitch to, to get sorted out, there was one question that was raised uh, earlier. Okay, the question that was raised here, and maybe um, uh, Franz, maybe I will ask uh, Professor Franz Klepper to help answer this. So he was asking, is there any data about the use of drug-coated balloons in significant side branch lesions for bifurcation lesion? So the use of DCB in uh, bifurcation. Franz, are you still online with us? Would you be able to help me answer that question? No, I think we lost the faculties for the time being too. So while we're waiting, I think, you know, I hope we can get the overseas faculties. Oh, um, okay, some of you are back. I can see myself, but I can't see Franz uh, here. Then, you know, maybe, if Franz is not here, um, maybe I'll get TK on to help answer that question. TK, uh, what's your yeah. view on drug coated balloons in bifurcation? Any, uh, any data, uh, clinical uh, data on that, and what's your view on that? Professor Clever is back. But I think there are some data, um, not huge studies, uh, which shows that it's uh, useful. In fact, I, I always say that a drug coated balloon strategy is the ideal strategy for bifurcation lesions. And whenever I have a bifurcation lesion in my lab, I'll tell my fellows or my colleagues, we don't have to worry whether to use culotte or to use DK crush or to, you know, all these uh, complex bifurcation techniques. Don't worry about it if we just use a DCB. You know, it's ideal for bifurcation. Uh, I'm, TK, I'm going to follow up one more question to you. In a bifurcation situation, I presume we are, you are talking about stenting main, main vessels and DCB side branch. Um, in a situation like that, you use the DCP before or after you stand the main vessel? Ah, uh, no, actually I'm using DCBs for both the side branch as well as the main vessel. Uh, but yes. if, I need, if I need to stand the main vessel, then I would DCB the side branch first before I stand the main vessel. Okay. And the main reason is because if I stand the main vessel, uh, I might have difficulty getting a drug called the balloon into the side branch. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and you don't want to damage the balloon or delay the delivery and deployment of the drug called the balloon in the side branch. So I always treat the side branch first. Okay, thank you, TK. Um, Kleber, uh, Franz Kleber, Franz, 
can I can I get you back to talk about the data in the use of DCP in bifurcation? I know you don't stand at all, so I won't ask you the same question. But what do you what are the can you share with us the clinical data behind the use of DCP in side branch? Um, I, I think we have uh, uh, with the DCB in bifurcation lesions, we have a, a much faster and much easier intervention usually. Um, the most important part of this is that we have uh, the um, uh, positive remodeling uh, also for bifurcations. And um, uh, uh, even if you just okay, treat the main vessel and you have only osteo. Uh, um, uh, side branch lesion, then you will open up the ostium because the whole vessel gets larger and uh, the ostium also benefits. Uh, um, this was uh, very nicely shown by the uh, Korean group with OCT. And um, so it's true, yes, we, we treat usually uh, um, uh, bifurcations by DCB only. Um, the question was if we need the stent in a, in a main branch for a severe dissection, then yes, we, we tend to use the DCB in the side branch before. Uh, it's not mandatory, but we are, um, as has just been said by Dr. Ong, um, we are a little bit afraid that we don't get the, the DCB into the side branch uh, through the stent mesh, or that we get uh, rid of some of the coating of the balloon while we pass the stent. That's why it's probably preferable to use the uh, um, DCP in a side branch before we uh, stem the main branch. Great. So but, another reason uh, why. Course, it depends, uh, it depends on uh, uh, always on the on the situation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are we back to our PowerPoint? Okay. Let's let's get the PowerPoint back on. Okay, so this is the uh, questionnaire survey that we conducted uh, uh, during the COVID time when we all have time to answer uh, questionnaires. So we are looking at DCB angioplasty uh, and insight for the international DCB survey. So which are the countries uh, that have responded to our questionnaires? So you can see that really across Asia. Um, because you know we, we are based in Singapore and a lot of questions. I, I've been WhatsApping a lot of you to reply, so we have a very good response from Singapore 61. But actually, you look at it, uh, the response came across uh, the ASEAN region pretty well. And also, we have a lot of reply from Japan and Hong Kong as well. So it's a reasonably good reflection of our practice in this area. And the, you can get a feel of the uh, experience of the interventionist. Uh, it seems that a lot of people who re uh, reply to us are a uh, pretty experienced operator of more than four years experience in performing uh, intervention. There is obviously going to be some uh, survey biasness, right? People who doesn't use DCB probably won't reply to our questionnaires. So you can see that you know there are a lot of people uh, who use the balloons quite a lot uh, in our region who responded to our questionnaires. 186 of us uh, have been using a drug, uh, more than 10 DCB per month. So these are reasonably high volume operators. Do you want to do that, Kera? Okay, so the first question uh, before we flash the results from the group uh, is, okay, just a clinical scenario, your patient presents with angina and the angiogram shows uh, instant retinosis in the previously implanted DES three years ago. So what would be your preferred uh, treatment strategy? Uh? So maybe we can ask uh, our young fellows. Maybe we start with James. James, uh, table two. Uh, what is your preferred approach? Uh? I think the first thing I'll do is uh, find out what was implanted three years ago. Um, maybe see whether there are any old pictures, where's the location and the size of stand uh, because at a fellow level we want to know the, the diameter of the vessel. Um, then subsequently probably uh, depending on location and the size, uh, try and glean the reason for the stand failing, maybe under expansion or, or something like that. And eventually I think we lean towards uh, DCB uh, after adequate preparation of the lesion, either with uh, cutting or, or non-compliant. Okay, thanks, thanks for your comments. Obviously, uh, you have been taught well in uh, Kutik Wat. <laughs> so, uh, okay, maybe you go to the... Uh, yeah, go to the... 
So I think, uh, I think from the survey, I think majority of the, uh, the respondents chose a uh, uh, drug-coated balloon uh, for uh, treating uh, DES, ISR, and uh, I think minority chose uh, DES. So I think we, we heard from the data previously, from what Paul shared, uh, from the Daedalus trial, I think uh, either way is okay, but there's, there seems to be a trade-off. So it depends on which one you choose, I think. Uh. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll take the lead on this one. Okay, your patients with angina, so they all have symptoms with previous ISR, DES, and follow what James said, you treated it with DCB a year ago. Unfortunately, the angiogram now shows ISR again. The patient have relatively low syntax score. What would your preferred treatment strategy be? Maybe this one, I will swing to the panels because it's not fair on our uh, juniors because at this point, usually you ask the boss to sort it out. So why don't I ask uh, our panelists, uh, uh, Yi Chang, uh, Dr. Xia Yijiang, are you still with us? How would you treat it? You, you already used DCP once a year ago. Uh, now the, the patient came back with DESISR. What would your strategy be? Yes, uh, this is a very question and a very common in our daily practice. For me, I will use uh, maybe another type of DCP to treat uh, this uh, kind of uh, lesion because uh, that's a very low synthetic score for this uh, patient. Uh, this is my practice. And uh, regarding the, the previous uh, question, regarding the ISI, I will see how about the type of ISI, if that's a focal ISI, of course, I will use a DCB to treat the very simple focal ISI. But if the ISI is very diffuse or even proliferative, or even sometimes uh, total occlusion, maybe the DE, uh, DES will have some role in, in the treatment of this ISR. That's a comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you talk about different type of uh, uh, DCB. Maybe I will send this question to TK. Uh, TK Ong, Dr. TK Ong, you, you have multiple choices of uh, DCB in your shelves. I know that. So in this situation, would you choose a different DCB or would you choose a different drugs even? or you just put a stent in? What, what's your view, TK? Uh, it, it depends on where the stent is. If, if the, the stent is not very long, it's in a segment where there are not many branches and uh, putting in a second layer of metal will not um, jeopardize side branches, then just to make life easy, I'll just deploy a, a drug eluting stent. However, if it's a relatively long stent and there are a lot of important branches there, uh, and uh, and uh, and I might need to put in if I have to put in another DS, it will be a very long DS. Then I will give the patient a second chance. So if the previous DS was a Pachytaxel DS, this time I would use a Cyrolimus DS because I both in my lab, right? So or vice versa, it was Cyrolimus before I will use a Pachytaxel, just to give the patient another chance of a DCB. Okay, great. Give the patient and the vessel another chance. I got it. Thank you. Okay, let's see what the survey came back as. I think the jury is split, right? You know, uh, you know, some of us are now maybe leading more towards second layer of stent, and still there's the diehard people who are 102 of us think DCB uh, may be listening to both uh, Yi Chang and also TK's comment, maybe choose a different uh, DCB. Okay, great. So uh, the next question. Uh, so the next question uh, is a different uh, lesion subset. So we have a patient presenting with angina and uh, angiogram shows a long diffuse 80% uh, lesion in the distal LED. Uh. So what will be your preferred uh, treatment strategy? Uh? So maybe I can ask uh, Joshua, table five. Yeah, Joshua is good. He did a case with me like that. <laughs> Sorry, this, this question, is it? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, it's, it's up there, it's up there. So, so uh, long diffuse les lesions. Small vessel, essentially, yeah, distal so, LED. So this is actually not uncommon in the Asian population. And um, in NUH also, we did several studies where we looked at small vessels. And we find that the uh, outcome of DCB versus DES are quite comparable in such a subset. Especially for the distal LED, I think it's important that we, we preserve graft targets uh, in future for the surgeons. And um, I've also attended several sessions where, you know, the Tantoxic experience showed that these vessels in the distal LED after DCP actually remodel after a few months. 
So I think for distal LED, I would treat, uh, especially in such vessels, small vessels, uh, my first choice would be DCB. Um, the problem about small vessels is that there is also a higher risk of uh, dissection. Um, and with dissection, you would actually need some form of uh, bailout stenting. So one way to mitigate that is actually to do uh, intracoronary imaging, get the vessel size right, and then uh, during the lesion prep, you know, do it carefully, low pressure, slow and steady inflation, and um, followed by DCB. Yeah. Okay, thank, thanks for your comments, sir. Uh, maybe we'll ask uh, Professor Kleber, I mean, uh, uh, with this, when you see this kind of patient in your cath lab in Germany, uh, what would be your preferred approach? Eh? Well, um, I think for, for long lesions, um, we do a, a thorough lesion preparation and then mostly use a DCB. Um, you can add a spot standing, but in most cases, it's not necessary. Um, I think it's very important to, to adhere to the dissection uh, uh, classification. Um, uh, if there is no persistent staining after the uh, lesion preparation, even if the vessel looks really ugly, um, then you can use a DCB and don't worry about the outcome. Um, actually, cases with dissections uh, have a better positive remodeling than cases without dissection. Um, so uh, don't fear dissection. If it's really severe, you can always stand, uh, do a thorough lesion preparation and apply a long DCB. Um, most important is not to stand very long um, uh, lesions uh, over the whole length because then you have a much higher restenosis rate. Let me briefly uh, uh, add a point to the uh, ISR case uh, you, you addressed before. Um, you know, after one year after DCP application, this is, in my opinion, uh, is not a failure of the DCP because you have restenosis after a second DES as well. You have to consider a 10 to 15 percent re restenosis rate um, after um, ISR treatment. And the option is just do it again. And you have, again, these uh, 85 to 90 percent success rate. That's not bad. Thank you very much for your comments. So we show you the results. Uh, so I think uh, I think majority uh, chose to treat it with uh, DCB. Okay, next question, uh, we'll let Paul lead. Uh. Okay, um, now your patients, this is looking at whether you listened to Dr. Ho's talk early on. Your patient has STEMI. An angiogram showed proximal RCA occlusion. Patient is otherwise stable what would your preferred strategy be? So a proximal RCA, uh, proximal RCA infarct, uh, how would you uh, manage this one? Maybe I'll, I'll swing it over to Deanna. Deanna, you were out of action a little bit from primary PCI. So how would you handle this in the middle of the night when the patient comes to you? Knowing that Dr. Ho is still watching. <laughs> Can we pass her? Okay, good. Um, so I think other factors will play a role. So the age of the patient. Um, so generally in younger patients, uh, try to shy away from implanting stents and might go towards a DCB strategy if uh, lesion prep was adequate. Um, also, if there was a lot of diffuse disease, um, sometimes I might swing towards a DCB strategy as well, especially since I'm from TTSH. Uh, but generally if it's um, it's a, if it's a short lesion, uh, in a STEMI case, uh, my tendency would be to implant the DES. Okay, thanks, Diana. So, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think for STEMI, I think it depends on the lesion. And of course, what Diana mentioned, uh, patient's age. So if very young patients, sometimes I think most of us may be reluctant to put in a stand. But I think if the, the uh, lesion is challenging, you have to stand, you have to stand. I mean, you have to do the right thing to... Uh, establish flow and uh, make sure that patient is safe overnight. So, uh, I think if you look at the results of the survey, I think a majority of us will use a DES uh, when it comes to uh, primary PCI. Okay. So,
So the next uh, clinical scenario, we move on to a, a rather more complex. Uh, so if you have a, a bifurcation lesion, maybe Medina 111, size of diagonal is 2.5. So what will be your preferred uh, treatment strategy? So maybe you can swing this to uh, Dr. Uh, Nakamura. I mean, you showed us uh, a lot of distal left main uh, bifurcation, but when it comes to LED and diagonal, uh, what is your preferred treatment strategy? Usually, I think uh, in Japan, we prefer the single stenting crossover, the no touch side branch. So actually, this is the main strategy. And actually, currently, we use a physiological check. Anyway, uh, just single stenting. And uh, if the flow is OK, checking physiology, the physiology is OK, no touch. This is maybe a regular strategy in Japan. Uh, if you have to do a pull bar on the side branch? No, no, no touch. So actually, currently, uh, this is maybe, I think, a uh, uh, standard approach in uh, Japan. Just single st shingle stenting and uh, if the flow is okay, no touch. So maybe I can ask uh, one of our... Uh, uh, but to, to, today, I, I want to do DCB. <laughs> okay. Maybe we can ask uh, Imran uh, for to take part. Huh? Uh, what is your approach if you face a uh, complex? So will you opt for a two stand strategy or maybe a provisional? Well, if it is a really complex bifurcation, a big size diagonal, and there's a proximal disease about the bifurcation, I might go for bifurcation PCI proper. But if it's like a salvageable diagonal, which even if I lose, I can save it after rewiring, I might just do provisional. So it all depends how bad is diagonal disease. Main vessel will stand anyways. Side branch extent of CAD is more important to look at the planning of side branch intervention is provisional versus bifurcation. So a focal lesion, if like if not an ostium, vessel is like a fair size, I might leave it for provisional, but long lesion uh, must be salvaged, can cause a big infarct. I will just go upfront bifurcation and plan it accordingly. DBUs I normally do for my bifurcation provisional after rewiring. It's a bit odd because if I lost a branch, I have to rewire and balloon again. So DB, I don't use up front bifurcations. And one more thing I'm doing, a more frequent now is something called jade balloon and geoplasties where we use long, small balloons like a 220, 225 balloon and leave in the side branch while doing main vessel PCI. And that almost always work in you know, our scenarios and I don't have to bail out these branches. So these are the few options on table. Okay, th thanks for sharing your experience. So we just shared the results of the survey. Uh, you can see that uh, there's many uh, preferred approaches. I guess uh, every one of us, uh, some of us would prefer a two stand, some will prefer a DCB only approach for the main vessel and side branch. But I think the vast majority will choose a provisional. Uh, they use DS to the main branch and DCB to the side branch. So I think there seems to be a heading towards the provisional approach. So the next question, uh, okay, Paul, you want to ask? This? Sure. Okay. So um, your patients have symptoms of angina and also high bleeding risk. What would your preferred treatment strategy be? Um, maybe this one. I will get this. Maybe Julian. Julian, you you see this group of patients in your practice day in day out. High bleeding risk patients coming to you. Stand DB. I don't think we have BMS anymore. So, what, what's your plan? So yeah, I, I, I would normally uh, treat these uh, high bleeding risk patients, equivalent to those like we see in uh, in STEMIs, where your uh, purpose is just to establish flow, and if there's a question mark as to how long their DBT can last, then my preference would actually be to not put in the stand because that then that, that takes away the the dilemma of how long you can. Put the, put the patient on, on DAPT. Okay. So yeah, I mean, if the lesion is suitable for DCB, my preference would be DCB. Okay. I'm, I'm going to ask your neighbor, uh, Jiaming, what do you think? Um, now the DES also have data of one month DAPT, so seems that the advantage of DCB versus DES is now narrowed. Would, would that change your practice? Thanks. Um, I think it really depends with what the lesion is. So it, the lesion is in a more distal location, you know, small vessel, or even potentially osteocirc, then potentially, uh, we might 
be able to get away with putting a DB limited duration of uh, antiplatelets and uh, protecting the patient uh, from severe bleeding events. Uh, if the lesion is actually in a big old uh, diameter, uh, you know, more complicated lesions, bifurcations, I, I might actually end up putting a DES with, a, uh, with good results from the short uh, bleeding these trials. Sorry, I, I didn't quite get you at the end. So it, it just cast your bet. Which one would so you use? So the lesion is more complicated, yeah, I might get by with just treating with a DES uh, with a high pain risk of DES. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, can you refresh the next uh, Okay, so the results is, uh, yeah, I think uh, seems like majority chose uh, drug with the balloon and, and uh, followed by a drug eroding stent. Uh, okay. So now the moving on to a different lesion subset. So your patient presents with angina. Uh, angiogram shows mid LED lesion and you do the lesion prep. So this is a different approach to evaluate the lesion, uh, how ready the lesion is uh, for DCB angioplasty. So you use a pressure wire and it shows that the FFR is 0.67. So what will be your treatment strategy? Eng Han? Uh, maybe you can ask uh, Eng Han. Uh, Thank you for the question. So this is a patient with mid LED lesion and uh, which is functionally significant on FFR. Um, the, pre the preferred treatment strategy for mid LED disease would be would be stenting with a DES, especially if uh, since the mid LED is a large vessel. Can we, we okay? We will try to ask this question to. Uh, no, but this is sorry, Inghan. I I'm going to hold you to that. You done the lesion prep, okay, and the FFR is still 0.67, so you will DES, right? Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So um, maybe we can ask uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Kleiber. I mean, uh, do you do a physiological assessment uh, to see whether the lesion is ready before you apply the DCB? Uh, because that appears in the recent uh, international consensus document. Um, this is indeed a uh, question that's not easy to answer. Uh, I have to confess in my hands uh, that the visual judgment of uh, the lesion uh, uh, preparation is uh, uh, better than the uh, post uh, lesion preparation FFR measurement. And I did a large number of patients that did not have a sufficient um, FFR measurement. Uh, or, or result after lesion preparation and still got a very nice acute and long-term result. So I don't think uh, that um, FFR measurement is very nicely evaluated for post-lesion preparation. It's a very good tool for pre-dilatation to decide whether to, to, um, uh, to dilate or to leave the lesion. It's probably not as good as a tool uh, for uh, judging the uh, result of lesion preparation. So if the uh, result is nice, I still would uh, go ahead, probably. Mm, what about QFR? Um, anyone use QFR here? Sometimes after lesion prep, you can do a QFR and the lesion prep QFR is sufficient. That opens up other possibility too. Yeah, I think uh, maybe Cliff, you want to comment, Cliff? Cliff have a special interest in QFR, so he has done some work, so maybe he can share some uh, comments. So uh, I think we, uh, from our lab's validation, I'm from Tanosing, by the way, so our lab has been using QFR for a couple of years, if not three to four years. And so, so far, our correlation with uh, QFR and FFR has been pretty accurate. And so if there are quite a lot of studies showing that if FFR is actually more than 0 0.80, using DEB afterwards, so quite a good long lasting results. And so we actually have a little bit of an extrapolation that using QFR more than 0 0.80 after POBA and you use DB after that, our hypothesis is that this actually would have quite a good long lasting results as well. We have been doing a little bit of a registry so far and um, around six to one year kind of follow up, the results has been actually pretty encouraging. 
So uh, we look forward to the end of the one year for most of our population in our reg registry. Okay, thanks very much, Cliff. So the let's see what the result shows. So I think like uh, I think most chose what Eng Han chose will be uh, implanting a drug eluding stent. Uh, okay. So we, so I think you're coming to the last question. I mean, uh, so in your daily practice, uh, do you actively consider DCB for your patients undergoing PCI? So uh, maybe we can ask Sabina uh, Kin. Uh, how often do you consider DCB when you do PCI in every case? And this is a quite a philosophical question. Uh, so, when a patient is in the lab, I always have the intent to try not to put any metal behind. Um, but it really depends on your uh, preparation, right? If you prepare and there's a lot of recoil, there's some dissection which you're not comfortable with, then I end up putting in a stent. But if the preparation is all good, looks good, I do try to get away with the DCB. Um, I think. One of the main places which I use DCB is for the bifurcations. Uh, it considerably reduces my time for the procedure. So instead of doing an upfront two stent, uh, you know, DCBing the site and doing a provisional to the main vessel helps significantly reduce procedural time for me also because it's a much faster procedure. It's something that we realize, uh, especially so if the patient asks you after the radial puncture, doctor, are we done yet? So you know, we quickly just uh, finish the side branch and the main vessel. So I do think about it a lot. Whether I do it, it's another question. Thanks for your comments. Maybe we can ask our uh, fellow panelists. Uh, I'm sure Professor Kleber will be 100%. So Dr. Nakamura, Dr. Ai Cheng Xia, and Dr. T.K. Ong, uh, do you actively consider? I mean, uh, maybe we start with Dr. Nakamura. You to me, to me, How often do you consider? Uh, it's like, is it every lesion you, you give it a chance to uh, perform DCB angioplasty? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nakamura? So actually, in Japan, of course, instant resources, first choice of DCB. And uh, small vessel disease, previously, maybe I think a small market in the DCB in, in Japan. But currently, we have uh, some new idea. The very good vessel preparation, preparation like a multiple cutting with a uh, cutting balloon. Multiple cutting. Just not, not one cutting. Multiple cutting makes the vessel preparation much better. And then use DCB. This is maybe, I think, a better result. So currently now Japanese, um, you know, recognize that so the market of the small vessel disease and the market of the instant resources, and some doctor using, uh, you know, uh, bifurcation region PCI, the side branch stenting, uh, they use a the DCB. So far, maybe I think 50% of the case, maybe I think Japanese use a DCB. I think. But today, maybe I think uh, 30%. Uh, any comments from uh, Dr. Uh, Ai Cheng Xia from Taiwan? I mean, uh... Yes, yes, for me, of course, the first consideration is the ISR region. And uh, for the Dinoro region, I will consider use a DCB in a small vessel and uh, the side branch of bifurcation region. And uh, sometimes we we'll use the DCB after a load operator. Uh, because sometimes the balloon cannot dilate the calcified region very well, even we use the load operator. And uh, for some STEMI patient, if we cannot make sure, very make sure the actual diameter of the vessel, uh, because uh, as we know, uh, if we're standing in the um, STEMI patient, sometimes uh, we will choose the undersize of the stand. Uh, sometimes after a couple of months later, we follow our angiography, we can find the stand size too small. So sometimes for this kind of patient, I will use the DCB first and see how about the result. Thank you. And then Dr. Tiki Yong, uh, how about yourself? Uh, in, our, in our institution, uh, the DCB is the default strategy for all lesions and for all situations, whether it's a SES or stable angina. 
So now I think the DCP PCI represents about 70% of our cases. Uh, we only use stents as bail out if you felt a DCB uh, approach. So in on average, we do about 1,000 cases of DCB PCI a year. Yeah. Can if you show the slides? So uh, so this is the uh, results from the survey. I think uh, yeah, I think majority do consider using DCB uh, when their patients undergo uh, PCI. So we're coming towards the. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. That, uh, may I have a, a comment that uh, uh, sometimes uh, in Taiwan the DCB also was applied to the uh, intracranial artery stenosis and the carotid artery standing restenosis by our neurologist, as, uh, as well as the peripheral artery stenosis, as you know, especially the low limb uh, PAD by endovascular interventionist. And more interesting, the cardiologist use uh, DCB to treat the pinea and the pudental artery stenosis in patients with erectile dysfunction and uh, demonstrated a very good preliminary result. So I think that's also a very interesting field to use a DCV uh, outside of the beyond the coronary artery uh, disease. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we just show you the uh, slide show, uh, the global trend of DCB uh, versus DES. Uh, I don't know how uh, Bibron obtained this data. This was uh, shared by Professor uh, Bruno Scheller in one of the talk. And you can see that the, uh, the usage of uh, DCP to DS ratio varies around the world. I mean, it's almost zero in America, especially for coronary. And they're starting to do some in uh, Africa and South America. But everything started in uh, Germany, where the, rate, uh, the current ratio in Europe is about 1 to 25. In Asia, uh, it's like 1 to 10. And it seems like in Japan, the, the ratio is 1 to 4. So, so I don't know how accurate this is. But uh, anyway, uh, we would just like to ask uh, Professor Kleber, I mean, we, we know that there are barriers to using uh, DCB, uh, either could be, uh, some people believe that we should follow a uh, guideline-driven uh, uh, recommendation, it could be the cost, could be cultural, and uh, what are the ways you think we, you, uh, we can do to encourage more DCB usage, uh, since you are one of the pioneers? Uh, Thank you, Ron. Um, uh, you know, uh, it has a lot to do with reimbursement. It had a, has a lot to, to do with cultural things. Um, but overall, I think uh, every patient deserves a clear consideration. Do I need an implant or do I not need an implant? And this you cannot decide before you predilate the lesion. And I think for those lesions, who have a nice result. Um, I, I don't say a decent result, but if you have a nice result and you cannot predict how good the result will be before you predilate. Um, if you have a nice result and a good flow, and this is especially important, I think, for acute myocardial infarctions, um, we should really say um, the DCB is at least as good as a DS, and then, and then you don't have an implant and you, can never ever predict whether you get a patient with uh, instant restenosis or uh, repetitive instant restenosis after applying a DES. So even if you think, well, I use the DES because it's a, a, a very uh, well-established treatment, uh, in the individual patient, you cannot predict how the outcome will be and you don't get rid of this then. And we all have some patients who have uh, 10, 15, or 20 DES in their coronary vessel. And uh, uh, reconsidering this, we don't have such a problem um, with uh, uh, drug-coated balloons. That's why I think every, every patient, every lesion deserves a consideration to not use a stent. Um, uh, and if you consider it, then you, you are completely open for, for any uh, decision, but you should consider in my opinion. Thanks, uh, Professor Kleber. So I think uh, I'm just going to uh, end today's session. I think the take-home message for today's webinar, I think, is that uh, DCB-only uh, angioplasty is safe and feasible in many lesion subsets. So I think we should try to use it more beyond the ISR. And I think certain steps are important. We need to prepare the lesion very well. So we heard 
You need a lot of patience and persistence. We heard how Dr. Nakamura can do 100, 100 cuts before he applies DCB. And importantly, is, uh, we must know our dissection grade so that we know uh, which lesions to leave uh, alone and which uh, lesions we need to stand uh, as a bailout stenting. I think when you think about it, uh, when you do a DCB angioplasty, it's basically an art of converting severe CAD into minor CAD. And the beauty of it is you leave nothing behind. So uh, with that closing remarks, uh, I would like to close uh, today's session. I would like to thank my co-chair, Paul, and all the uh, overseas uh, faculty, Professor Clever, Dr. Nakamura, Dr. Ai Cheng Xia, and Dr. T.K. Ong. I would like to thank our uh, Singapore uh, attendees on site, as well as those who tune in online. Uh, thank you very much for attending today's session. Uh, special thanks to B. Braun for sponsoring uh, this uh, afternoon's uh, webinar. I would like to thank our APEC Secretariat, Christina and Yilin, for the hard work and preparation, and also to uh, Spring Forest Studio for the uh, technical support. Uh, I think the last two years has been very challenging for all of us, but we are seeing, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I think we can travel soon and see each other physically again. So uh, uh, we do remember that uh, for our Muslim friends, uh, Hari Raya is next Tuesday, so we would like to wish our Muslim friends uh, Salamat Hari Raya or Eid Mubarak and have a good weekend, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.